Well, I, I read about a big collection of 45s you have. Um, what was the first one you bought? <sighs> wow, the first 45 I ever bought, I really don't even know. Um, my dad had a few, like only like probably like 30 or 40, and I kind of appropriated those. Um, I don't know, like when I, when I was in Mississippi and in Chicago, I just kind of would just pick them up all the time, and I started just getting, going to Salvation Army's thrift stores and buying, a, you know, whatever, whatever looked interesting to me. So I, I never, I can't remember the, the first one I bought, no. And how old were you? 18 or 19, okay. yeah. And the, can you remember one of your favorite ones? Well, when I was in Chicago, I found a lot of like stuff that was local to there, you know, uh, Got to Find a Way by Harold Burridge or something like that, or Sil Johnson on Twinite, stuff like that, Otis Clay on, on MPAC, you know, a few things like that. And did it influence you also of being, well, I want to be a musician too? I mean, I was already playing and singing at that point. Um, I, you know, I think it's, you know, hearing the, the, the songs the way that they were intended to be heard on the format that they were intended to be played is kind of important. And those records are always very l large and in charge, very, very, they're, they're cut very loud. A lot of the time they're kind of distorted and, and dirty sounding, and, and I always enjoyed that, that kind of, you know. And is that still important for you? Uh, yeah, the, well, something that, uh, 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 sonic aggressiveness, I guess, would be the quality that I enjoy about, about pretty much any music that I like has got to be aggressive, you know, with, with some kind of, you know, energy to it and, you know, sometimes, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. Well, you prefer soul music. Did also your parents listen to soul music often? They did, yeah. I mean, my dad plays soul, soul music, but a lot, a, lot of, a lot of blues and mm -hmm. country music, gospel around the house, you know, things like that. Yeah, because you also sing in a uh, gospel church, right? Yeah, there's a few more, more than a few, yeah. Yeah, well, when did you uh, sing there? Uh, I started singing in churches when I moved to Chicago, so I was eight, 19 or 20 and with church with Mitty Collier, and then, and then I, when I moved back to Boston, I was singing in churches in Boston and groups in Boston as well. And what did you learn from that period? Oh, church? I mean, I think that you learn a lot about how to... I mean, just a lot about singing in general, a lot about, you know, about, about, you know, getting the message across and being, you know, because you can't, can't fake it. You just have to, you have to, you have to go 100%. And also as a musician, responding to the, the congregation, the people that would stand up, responding to the preacher, because it wasn't like we had a choir. It was just me. And then the congregation, the people would stand up and they would start to sing if they got the spirit, you know, the, or the preacher would start to sing if she got the spirit. So it wasn't like, I think people... Imagine some gospel church, like there's a big a bunch of people in robes. It's not like that. This is like a storefront with a bunch of regular people. You know, it's very small. You know, these are regular people coming to, coming to church every day. I mean, most of the time, churches in the black community are not even in a church. It's just a storefront or a community center. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, can you remember your first performance? Was it also in a church? Or? No, no. I mean, I, I started playing music with my dad um, when I was about 14, and we would play together. I would play harmonica, and he'd play guitar, and we, I would sing, and we played, like, around, you know, nothing like... I mean, I remember early on, I, I played, like, open mic nights when I was in high school and played harmonica sometimes and things like that very, very early on in my, in my musical life. So you feel very home at the stage? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm never, I'm not, I'm not one to get nervous about singing or playing in front of people. And when did you write, or wrote your first song then? <sighs> I think, I mean, I started writing in high school, okay. uh, 17 or 18, but nothing like that I felt like, I was just kind of trying to write in a style or whatever. And then when I got to college, when I was in college, I was in Chicago, uh, I was writing some more stuff that was like more like what I, what the songs that ended up being on the first album then and, and at that point, and so I was 20, 20, 20 or 21, you know, things like that. And how do you look back on the boy back in the days now? It's funny, I mean, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a better singer and I'm a better songwriter and I'm a better entertainer and I'm, than I was, but I think at the time, I thought that I was the best that I could be. And I think it's really important that at every stage of your career, one of my ethos 
as a performer is that at every step you have to be as confident in yourself as possible. Like, even looking back, you can say, oh man, I wasn't any good back then. But at the time, I was like, man, I'm, I'm the shit. I'm going to make it happen, right? Because otherwise, if you don't believe in yourself, who's going to believe in you, you know? Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, in 2005, you released your first album. Mm -hmm. um, do you still listen to that music? Oh, man. Actually, I was just playing a song for Jesse this afternoon. Okay. From, for, but not, not regularly, no. Uh, I haven't listened to it in a very long time. Um, it, you know, it's, it, to me, it sounds like a 20-year-old, you know. But it's, I, I really, I think it was really kind of a moment in time. You know, we recorded that album in one day. Everybody in the room together playing. And it was a special, special moment, you know. And a lot of the guys who played on it were my very good friends who I've been playing with since I was a very little kid. You know, so it's 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 a special thing, and you know, we it, we only pressed a thousand copies. They're all gone. They've been gone for years. You know, so oh. it's a collector's item at this point. Yeah, and um, in 2010, you uh, released your previous album. It took you four years. Uh, no, years. well, I did I did a record in 2008. The roll with you was in 2008. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then right, so we had roll with you, to then yeah. come again in 2010. Okay. Yeah. And um, well, it took you some years to roll this album. This one, yes. Yeah. Oh, why did you uh, get so much time for this album? Well, we finished, you know, Come and Get It was, was, was probably the most successful album that I, that I had ever had. And we spent a lot of time touring behind Come and Get It. I was really, you know, especially we had a, a, an international success of a record, which, you know, for, for at least to some degree. So I had to go to all these different places and play. So it was really almost two years of, of touring from Come and Get It. So 2010 to 2012 was pretty much on the road uh, and then we came off the road and and I changed labels and kind of in the in the process of that I wanted to you know I didn't really make a conscious decision but we myself and my writing partner and production partner Ryan we started just working on new music and nobody was touring we had some time off so we spent a year just like working on new music in different ways we went, took some trips to Los Angeles and started writing with different people and it was the first time in, since like 2007 that I had really had some time to really kind of step back and say, okay, what do I want to do with my music right now? Do I want to make another similar sounding record or do I want to try to do something that's going to maybe break out of the box a little bit? Why did you have that feeling? Well, I felt like I made, you know, I still think that Come and Get It and Roll With You are very different records, but they're still kind of in the same kind of category. And I felt like if I was going to make another record like that, then there was no way that I could ever not make records like that. Then it was just going to be, that was what I was doing. That was, you know, there's lots of artists out there that do things like that, and they're really amazing at what they do. But pretty much with every record, you can sort of expect something. And I, and I just didn't really want to be that kind of artist. I wanted to try to make something different and also try to expand my fan base. You know, I think we had great success with Come and Get It, but I also think the Sonics the quality of the sound in a way held me back from having more success, more, being able to play for more people. And it, for me, like the goal really is to be able to just get out and get my music in front of as many people as possible. Not for my own sake really, but just because uh, I'm proud of what I do. I love my music and I love the music that I feel I represent. And I want to be able to, you know, go out and and proselytize for that music for as many people as I can. So if I have a number one record and somebody interviews me and says, man, what do you listen to? And I say, oh man, I listen to Julius Cheeks and the Sensational Nightingales. Maybe a million people are gonna go out and say, man, who is this guy, Julius Cheeks and Sensational Nightingales? That's a pretty, so that's a lot of power to have. So, and I also just felt like it was time to just make a change. Why not, you know, it was, it was, it was it, it's, as a writer and as a singer, I, I felt like I don't want to be stagnant. I think it would be, it's not good for me.